good afternoon. Good afternoon again. Straight up, I know that you're having lunch and yeah, and drinks, but basically I think you're thank you all for coming. My name is Peter Reddy, I'm a professor of marketing and the director for Central Marketing at Breakout. And we run this uh, series uh, during the year, and I think this is the early part of the year. We have several planned in the next week, and then uh, and I'm away for a couple of months, but we'll start again in January. So some exciting speakers are in, in line. And so today is no exception. So we have John, John Bailey here. Uh, he's one of the leading experts on crisis management, and he's actually he's in, in, in air, air, airlines. And so he'll tell us a little bit more about it. And I think one of the elements that essentially has changed the way that we deal with crisis management is, is a technology. So gone were the days when it essentially you could sort of wait until the crisis breaks and then you actually have a team working on it and then you respond to it within several days. No longer is it the case. And I think that actually makes it even more exciting. And job, nobody does better than job. And I think yeah, that's that's uh, that's the thing. Just, just to give you an overarching view, you have the the bio in front of you, but I thought I'm, I'm quite impressed in terms of that. He started a company called Icon several years ago, 2005, um, which deals with the crisis management, specifically, I think, specializing in air, air, airlines. And it was bought by uh, Ketchum, and then now he's now the partner and managing director of Ketchum. Uh, and the scope of what he does, he just told me essentially has increased quite dramatically. Yeah. Um, he lives in Singapore, has been here for 14 years. And prior to that, he had a stint for, for three years in Singapore. He actually moved from Geneva, Switzerland, where he started it. So he has obviously clients globally and IAPA. And I was just teasing him that there is no dearth of crisis for him uh, in terms of solve. So I think, yeah, so uh, I want to actually invite him uh, uh, for delivering this talk. Because I think uh, he does a program for us every year. Um, uh, what we develop is something called Digital Works. And we've done it for nine years, and so this year we're hoping we'll do it again, 10th anniversary. But outcome of this is we published a book uh, 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 earlier this year, which is essentially called Digital Words, The Future of Marketing in a Digital World. And he, is, uh, he has a, a chapter essentially dealing with this topic in this. So what we're doing is, yeah, based on your contribution to this discussion today, John will essentially hand over four of the copies, one copy each, to whoever actually sort of deserves it as, as a, yeah. Ask a good question or, or answer a great, uh, provide a great answer, you get one of those, okay? If there's still more to be done, I think Hewling will actually provide you, get your name and address, and then we'll actually send you a copy or, or two uh, later on, okay? So here is, is that, that's, that's an incentive to pay attention, but also to be uh, adept at actually asking very interesting questions or answering some of the questions that John might have. John, with a much ado, please. Uh, yeah. okay, thanks, Professor, everybody. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for, uh, for taking the time to join us for this, uh, this session today. Um, uh, as, as Prof. Reddy said, I, I, my, my day jobs are on a PR company. Uh, which is cash and groups in my own agency, Icon. Uh, but my background is all in crisis management, crisis communications, and specifically in the airline industry. Um, before I came to, uh, to Singapore in 2005, rather I came back to Singapore, uh, I spent seven years in Switzerland and set up and ran a consultancy uh, in the aviation industry with the uh, global industry body, IATA. Um, <clears throat> the mission was to develop best practice and spread best practice uh, in crisis management, crisis communication, uh, in the aviation industry, so I worked with lots and lots of airlines, probably about 60 airlines, um, pretty much all major aircraft manufacturers, some of them, uh, and lots of other airlines too. Um, just a, bit, a little bit about Catch and Globally, we're, we're one of the top five uh, agency networks, um, part of the Omicom uh, Public Relations Group. In fact, we're being rebranded here in Singapore uh, as OPRG, effective 1st of January. Um, <clears throat> but coming back to the, the specialist topic, um, as the prophet said, when I came down to, to Singapore, uh, having left IATA, a lot of the work I've been doing with allies can follow me. In fact, IATA followed me too, so I still do a lot of work with IATA. I was working in Frankfurt with them uh, two weeks ago, uh, at the conference that I have held and set up every two years. But since I came here to Singapore, uh, we've worked with lots of other clients from a, a very wide variety of industries, uh, specifically on crisis communications, crisis management. Most recently, is actually not on the list uh, because we're starting next week. That's with Tangent Trust School, 
Um, the point of that, that, that example is just to illustrate it really doesn't matter what industry sector you're in, what sector of your organization. The fundamental principles of crisis management, crisis communication don't change. And everybody now is facing the same environment. Um, and, and to my mind, uh, you know, my, my starting point, the way I, I approach this now, is, is I firmly believe that um, the challenge of preparing for and responding to crises has never been more complicated than it is now. And it's not going to get any easier. It's only going to get worse. Um, so in fact, I've been at four conferences in the last two weeks in different parts of the world, uh, mainly talking to communication professionals. Um, and that's the message. It's not going to get any easier than it is today. And it is not at all easy today. Now, there's clearly there's two, there's two key reasons for that. One is pretty obvious. In fact, they're both pretty obvious. But one is the, the explosion and prolif proliferation um, of social media channels and the number of people who are active on social media every day. But what's facilitating that is technology. Two pictures here really illustrate the different world that we now live, now live in and how quickly that world has developed. This picture was taken in St. Peter's Square in Rome in 2005. The crowd you can see there is waiting to greet the casket of the previous Pope uh, who just passed away, uh, Pope John Paul II. Um, it wasn't the, uh, the, 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 new, the new Pope, uh, uh, Benedict, I think it was, had not yet been announced. So the, the crowd is waiting there to say farewell to John Paul II. Eight years later, in the same location, here is the crowd waiting to greet the new Pope Francis. I don't know. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> There's nothing more that needs to be said about that picture. But the point is, everybody now carries these, these smartphones. Everybody now carries uh, a recording device in their pocket. Everybody now has the ability uh, to share content from wherever they please. Now, I'll dig into that in a bit more detail and just explain some of the implications for companies. And then I'm going to give some very specific examples uh, a company of crisis that have uh, that gone, in some cases, very badly wrong, and we'll discuss why. And in one case, uh, actually, where the, uh, the brand survived and came out ahead, you know, I think you would argue. Um, so, looking, look, digging into the, some of the numbers a little bit, the one thing I'm, I, I know for sure about this number is it's wrong. Uh, it comes from statistics, it's bang up to date, but I've heard 4 billion, I've heard 3.5 billion. Uh, the, numbers, the numbers vary, but I think you can safely say about one third that the world's population is active on social media every single day. I think here in Singapore it's probably about 98%. Um, but globally it's about a third of the world's population. But that's really not the, not the key issue. The key issue, and the thing that's changed uh, the game completely in my view, is mobility. As I said, everybody carries uh, mobile phones in their pocket now. In fact, some, sometimes more than one. Um, so again, just digging into the details a little bit here, in 2014, we passed a tipping point where more than half of all internet access is now done on mobile devices. Now, that does not only include smartphones, that also includes tablets, laptops, uh, local computers, but within that population of mobile devices, the amount of internet usage on smartphones is itself increasing. In fact, what I'm describing here are trends. So these are trends which are already in motion and will not be reversed. So we passed that tipping point and we're not going back. Uh, so this is only going to increase. Uh, there are already, in fact, more mobile phones than people in the world. It's about 103% uh, of the world's population. That does not mean, clearly, that every individual in the world carries uh, a mobile phone. What it does mean is lots of people carry two. Uh, I think here in Singapore, lots of people carry three, sometimes four. Uh, so <clears throat> there are lots of phones out there. And again, within that population of mobile phones, not all of them are internet-enabled smartphones but the population of internet-enabled smartphones is steadily growing. And in fact, it's pretty much impossible now to buy a mobile device that does not uh, fall into that category. So project for two or three, four or five years from now, pretty much every, every mobile phone uh, that's carried by anyone will be Wi-Fi enabled, and they will all have embedded high-definition cameras, uh, which can take still or video images. Now, the other, the other key thing here is access to a network. Um, the ITU, which is the global um, UN organization that governs the, uh, the telecoms industry, um, they, project, they project that by 2030, at least in theory, every person on the planet will have access to high-speed broadband internet. That's astonishing. If you think about Malaysia Airlines, I was involved in the MH370 crisis. 
to this day that aircraft has not been found and disappeared over the, uh, the Southern Indian Ocean. What we're saying is by 2030 there will be Wi-Fi connectivity even across the waste of the Southern Indian Ocean. So every person on the planet, wherever they may be, and that's both through two types of networks. That's um, Wi-Fi networks, um, and you know, we're living in a smart, connected city here where Wi-Fi is available in pretty much every public building, uh, <clears throat> but also telco networks. And telco networks are evolving very, very quickly. Um, let me tell you how quickly. Um, <clears throat> Roughly now, 70% um, of all mobile internet use is uh, video content, or rather by, by 2021, about 70% of all mobile internet use will be video. Because if you put those two things together, the, the Wi-Fi enabled device in your pocket has an embedded camera. That means video content is being uploaded. Um, and our eyes are naturally drawn to images, not to text. In fact, our brains process an image I think the, the, the research shows 60,000 times faster uh, than it can process a piece of text describing that image. <coughs> so our eyes are naturally drawn to image, and they're naturally drawn to moving images rather than still images. But what we see is an evolution in about the last 15 years in terms of the kind of images that are being posted on uh, social media. Uh, we've gone from very grainy still images, in fact on 2G there were no images, was voice and text only. But when 3G came in, it doesn't seem that long ago that 3G networks arrived here in Singapore and other major, major Western markets. Um, that allowed then um, still images to be uploaded, and we've seen a steady evolution from still image, to, uh, from grainy still image to high definition still image, grainy video images, high definition um, uh, video images, and now to live streaming. And what's underpinning all that is technology. As I keep saying, these are telco networks. So if you don't know the difference between 3G and 5G, it's basically speed and capacity. Now we're already at 4G here in Singapore. The first 5G networks go into commercial operation this year in the United States. And look at the download speed. So roughly by the time you said, you said is it downloaded yet? It has already, you could already download a two hour, two hour episode a high, de high definition movie or, or, or a TV series, 3.6 seconds. So we are going to see a steady improvement, in fact an exponential improvement, in the quality and the, and the amount of video imagery out there on the internet, on social media, as if there isn't already enough. Um, <clears throat> and of course what, what's now possible because of Wi-Fi networks, because of uh, high capacity telco networks, is live streaming. This is not the future, it's already here. Um, <clears throat> now this this in itself creates a major challenge for communication professionals from any organization, but especially uh, organizations like airlines, where you're, 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 you're consumer facing, you operate 24 7. Everybody in and around and on your aircraft is carrying those phones. And if something happens, something that's amusing, funny, shocking, surprising, the first instinct everybody has now is to reach in their, in their pocket or reach in their purse, take out their, their, their camera and take a photograph. Because if I didn't film it, didn't happen, right? I've got to be the first to share it with all my friends. So what does this actually meant in terms of the airline industry? Uh, if you don't recognize this image, this is an Asiago Airlines Boeing 777 crashing in San Francisco. Uh, this picture was taken by, actually strange enough, by a Google employee, a girl called uh, Krista, who worked for Google, standing at the gate, waiting to board her flight, doing what we all do, this, and something catches her eye, Bit of movement. She picks up her, 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 her camera, or her phone camera, takes a picture, puts it on Twitter. 29 seconds after the aircraft hit the ground. So 29 seconds after the aircraft crash, the first picture is already in social media. Now that was in 2013. Let me just dig into the detail of what happened next. That happened in San Francisco. It was a lovely uh, summer morning. It was a Saturday morning as it happened. It was a public holiday weekend. It was 11:38 in the morning. And you won't want to do the math. This is worth a copy of the book, by the way. Can someone do the math and tell me what time you think it was in Seoul, which is the headquarters of Asian Airlines? So 11.38 on Saturday morning. Take a guess. Eight thirty-eight in the morning? Sunday? Not far off. Warm. Warm. 
think of, think of the most inhospitable time of the day. It's 3.38 a.m. That's worth a book bit. So 3.38 in the morning, Sunday morning. Now imagine you're a member of the emergency response team or a member of the communications team uh, as in our airlines. It's not even 4 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning and you're now being alerted. I'm assuming they have an automated alert system, most airlines do and being told that your aircraft has crashed on the other side of the Pacific. Now, <clears throat> think of the, just the, the human reaction to that, the disbelief. You need to wake yourself up, get yourself dressed, get in the car, head into the center of Seoul, go to Asiana Airlines office, mobilize your crisis team, try and work out what the heck's going on, and start taking decisions about how you're going to respond to what's happened on the other side of the Pacific. A couple of hours, maybe three hours, four hours. <laughs> 44,000 tweets about an accident in 30 minutes. The first 30 minutes after that picture appeared, 44,000 tweets, 52,000 within the first hour. So a social media firestorm has broken out globally. And this put the conversations I have at heat map shows the conversations happening all around the world while the Asiana Airlines and that emergency team were literally getting out of their beds. So you're already, by the time you've gathered and started to work out how you're going to respond and what you're going to say, you've lost it. The story's already run away from you. Uh, <clears throat> now, in the course of five years, we've gone from we've gone from that still image to this. This is three years later. This picture was taken in Dubai. Very similar uh, uh, picture. Anyone spot the difference? This is worth another book. We do. It's a screen grab. Who said that video. Okay. Sorry, video. You, can, you can have a book afterwards. Okay, yes, it's a screen grab. Now that's a recording. It's not uh, live streamed. It was a recording taken again by somebody in the terminal who saw, oh my god, look at that. Takes a, takes a, a video of it on his phone and uploads it onto, uh, onto YouTube actually using the free Wi Fi service very helpfully provided by Dubai Airport. Uh, and of course, social media just lit up with the uh, uh, the coverage of that accident. Now, as I said, within five years, we've gone from a still picture in San Francisco to a recorded image here in Dubai to this. This was in April this year. This is live streamed on the internet, uh, on Facebook Live, in fact. So the guy in the bottom left, left hand corner is called Martin Martinez. Um, this is Martinez is something of a social media star. He already had quite a big following before this happened. Uh, he was a passenger on the Southwest Airlines Boeing 737, suffered a catastrophic engine failure, David pierced the fuselage and, and smashed one of the windows and the lady was almost sucked out and was killed. They initiated an emergency <coughs> descent uh, into Philadelphia. Nobody else was injured, the aircraft landed safely, <clears throat> but it was a pretty horrific experience. Now, eight minutes, eight minutes after the engine blew up, Facebook lights up. Because what this guy has done, Mr. Martinez, has decided that the aircraft is probably going to crash. So he pulls out his credit card, pays $8 to get on the, uh, on the Southwest Airlines Wi-Fi service, fires up Facebook Live so he can say his last farewell to his family and his, friend, to his, family and his friends. That happened about eight minutes into the incident. Eight minutes into the incident is when Southwest Airlines started getting phone calls from the media. It literally happened like that. It was like switching on the light bulb. Uh, we, uh, one of the conferences, uh, conferences I was at in uh, Frankfurt uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the head of comms from Southwest, uh, Linda Rutherford, gave us a case study. And she said, we, we already knew from our, our captain uh, that the incident happened, so we were waiting for the media wave to come. Um, and it started eight minutes in, and because they'd, uh, they'd seen it on Facebook. Now I'm going to explain how that happened. How do you think something like this goes from being, makes the leap from being a social media meme, a social media phenomenon, into the mainstream media. Anyone heard of data mining? <coughs> this is an extraordinary, extraordinary um, business. They, it actually started in the intelligence community in the US. Um, they didn't actually tell me it was the CIA. It's in the intelligence community. But it actually, they decided it had much greater potential than they, went, they, they made it a commercial uh, business. It's grown absolutely exponentially. Um, it now, what it does, it looks at, um, at, at the internet 24-7, scans the internet, and it looks for sudden eruptions of social media activity in one location. So 
you know, if your base level of social media posts are, let's say, Changi Airport in Singapore, is 20 posts an hour, 50 posts an hour, and suddenly it spikes to 200, 300, 1,000 data miners, there's ah, ah, something's going on here. And what it then does very quickly, the algorithms make connections. Are all these posts talking about the same thing? Um, so are there any common hashtags, are there images, uh, any keywords? And it instant, this all happens instantly. It then instantly sends an alert to all its subscribers. Now, it's, the subscribers to data miner include 450 of the world's major news organizations. So BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, Sky News, uh, pretty much every major news organization you can think of gets data miner. Uh, CNN told me they get roughly about 250 alerts a day that something in the world is going on. Now they can't cover the 250 breaking news stories, so what they then do is they use that data miner to analyze what's going on, and then they decide if it's worth covering or not. Um, <coughs> So, Marty Martinez on Southwest Airlines, data miner spots his post, spots everybody looking at it, talking about it, spots the reaction to it, all the retweets, and sends out the alert to the media, who then immediately start calling Southwest Airlines. Now, fortunately, Southwest Airlines has data miner. So they spotted it. They spotted it. They got the same alert that all the journalists got. So um, major airlines uh, around the world, I know American Airlines for one. American Airlines, very interestingly, have actually reconfigure their entire crisis response structure around data miner. They've actually moved members of their social media team into their op center, and they sit on the bridge next to the duty manager 24-7. So if anything happens on an American Airlines flight or affecting American Airlines, and it hits the social net, they know straight away. And even if it only buys them a few minutes before the media calls, at least they know. They know what the call's about. And if it's a false alert, they know that too, because they can call from the op center, they can contact the captain on that aircraft and say, There's something out there saying you've had an engine failure. No, no, that's right. False alarm. Okay. Then when the media calls, say, Yeah, we've already talked to the captain, it's a false alarm. So, <clears throat> or it's a hoax, because not everything that appears on the internet, believe it or not, <coughs> is true. So, um, it's not just about, about accidents or incidents or things where people get hurt, it's pretty much any reputation crisis now or anything. <coughs> that might create a reputational challenge. I'm going to show you three different examples, only one of which is from the uh, airline industry. You probably won't be surprised at what I've chosen. United Airlines. This is pretty much the poster child for why you need to be on top of what's happening on the internet and ready to respond really quickly. So let me show you a bit of video that um, has been widely circulated. You may have seen it, uh, but it's worth just looking at it again. That's obviously wrong. Don't call one of them. Of course I'm angry as a Chinese, says another man. This airline is very dangerous. Seems like he only apologized after they saw that their stock price was dropping. Yeah, so welcome to the friendly skies. Um, that was obviously a, uh, the Dr. Dow drag and drop scandal. Um, but what's interesting about that is, is not just that it happened, but the number of people, you know, every single person on that aircraft had a mobile phone in their pocket. And you know, if you were sitting on a Singapore Airlines flight, that happened, or a scoot, or anybody else, do you think you'd take a picture of it? Do you take a video of it? Of course you would. Um, so the internet lit up with it. It was, it went absolutely everywhere. Um, and United Airlines responded. Now, how do you think they responded? They actually got their CEO involved right from the get-go. Who apologised for having to reaccommodate these customers? So this is reaccommodating customers seriously. So the the first response was absolutely. Uh, and it looked like it looked like two things. It looked like legal had drafted this, and not anybody from the communication department. Um, it also looked like whoever wrote it had not seen the images, which of course everybody else has seen. So the first thing you need to be, be aware of 
is what is everybody talking about? So if you don't have social listening yourself, if you don't have data like that, how can you possibly respond to what everybody's talking about if you haven't seen the images? So, so this is the first lesson here. So a very legalistic response, absolutely tone deaf, did not acknowledge what had actually happened to that map, what everybody else could see uh, for themselves. Now there's a bit of history here. Flying in the United States is a horrible experience, pretty much. And the US airlines, as a, as a sector, are the most profitable in the world. Um, they're extremely efficient, very profitable, but that, um, yeah, they, they have not reinvested, with some exceptions, they have not reinvested those enormous profits in improving the, the customer service um, <clears throat> or paying their staff better. And any one of you who have flown in the US will know exactly what I'm talking about. So customers are resentful anyway. So if you make your customers resentful because you've given them bad service and then you give them a reason, an excuse, an opportunity to give you a damn good kicking, well guess what they're going to do? They're going to give you a good kicking. Um, so what happened on social media? Well, not surprisingly, the volume of conversations about United Airlines went through the roof. The base level of mentions of, of uh, United on social media was actually fairly positive, about 60-40 positive, until the Dr. Dow scandal happened, and then you see the, 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 the volume of, of, of conversations shoots up, and negative commentary is about 90%, 90%. And, it, and in fact, if you that then has it as a direct flow through to public perception of the brand and the organization. And said so the US airlines as a sector are not that popular with their customers, but United Airlines is considerably less popular. And you saw the, they, they, they immediately plunge below the index and they did not recover. They did not recover. Uh, but more important, what did that actually do to the value of the company? Look at what happened to their share price. A billion dollars of value was wiped off the company in one day. Why? Because the consumer reaction to that was so extreme and you would have picked up in the video um, an actually mistaken uh, impression at the beginning that Dr. Dow was Chinese. Uh, in fact, he's a Vietnamese American, a resident in the United States. But in China, that absolutely took off on, uh, on Weibo, on WeChat, and every other social media platform because um, you know, Chinese people thought that was how the United States treated Chinese people. Um, and guess what? China is the number one international market in the world for United Airlines. So the threat of consumer boycott in China, which was very real for a while, um, you know, direct contributed to that, that drop in value of the company. But I'll show you a bit more about what lies behind that, that value reaction, if you like, uh, and how it's played out in other similar crises. Now, they did recover, uh, and I think they recovered for two reasons. It took a little while. One was because, uh, from a cynical point of view, as I said, the underlying financial fundamentals driving the share price performance are extremely positive. So any, any fund manager looking, looking at you know, a, a sharp decline in their share price when the fundamentals haven't changed, uh, probably saw that as a buying opportunity, which probably, probably accounted for the, uh, the recovery. But also what happened is the CEO then had to go out on an apology tour. So Oscar Munoz, who ironically had just been nominated, I think it was two weeks before, he'd been given an award by PR Week as communicator of the year, yeah. <laughs> then had to go out. And he's actually, he's actually a really good guy. Uh, I, I think he was mortified by when it actually what happened. Um, he then took it on the chin and he did a tour of major media outlets uh, in the week after that happened and basically said, we screwed up uh, and we're sorry, we got this wrong. And this wasn't just about how one passenger was treated. The fact that this could happen at all means it was a fundamental problem with how we treat our customers. I mean, he, 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 he couldn't have apologized more profusely. Um, I'll show you somebody who did, in fact, apologize even more profusely. But it actually came across as sincere, and he committed to a series of actions to fix it. And gradually, they have recovered. Um, so you know, they put in new customer service charter, they put in new training. So it's, it's, you know, these things happen. If you're a customer service business, and you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of customers, not all, all of whom are going to have a good day, you know, things aren't going to go wrong. They're not necessarily going to go that wrong, but they will go wrong. And um, the question is, when they go wrong, what do you then do about it? And what does your response tell people about who you are as a company? So he was, he went out and said, look, this is on me. I'm the CEO of this company. I have to take it. And he actually came out of it, out of it pretty well. Now, I'll show you a CEO who did not come out of it 
particularly well. Uh, different industry sector, this is in the banking sector. Uh, now, digital transformation is, you know, is a buzzword for it's sweeping across all kinds of industries at the moment. Um, you know, everyone's going through this, this massive deal. We're actually working with a major airline right now on their digital transformation program. So it's sweeping across all kinds of industry sectors. And that's great if you can improve the, 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 the quality of your service delivery. But if you get it wrong, you are really going to have a major problem, especially if you are a bank. Now, TSB in the UK is one of the oldest banking institutions in the UK. They went through a major IT upgrade, and they got it wrong. So I'm going to show you. Uh, first of all, their CEO, and again, they responded in the early days. They responded pretty much by the book. The CEO came out, he apologized, he explained, <clears throat> tried to put it in context, he talked about what they were going to do to fix it. But just watch what happened here happened in this, as this story developed. Because what actually happened is customers were locked out of their accounts. So the, smart, the smartphone apps didn't work, your e-banking didn't work, your uh, ATMs didn't work. Uh, so this became a massive, massive story. So here is the CEO apologizing. For the vast majority of customers in the vast majority of the ways, the bank is running smoothly. Let me be crystal clear. Any customer that is out of pocket as a consequence of, of, our, of our issues, uh, we of course will put them right. I apologise profusely to our customers. It must be incredibly frustrating to get someone like me saying, we're trying to get this fixed. Believe me, I want to get it fixed. I'm deeply sorry. I apologise profusely. I apologise profusely. I apologise and, uh, and reservedly. I'm very, very sorry. I'm very, very sorry. I deeply apologise for this. I can only apologise. I can only apologise. Apologise. I apologise profusely. I so, so deeply yeah. apologise. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm very sorry. Well, I'm sorry, and I apologise profusely. I, I'm deeply uh, apologetic, so I'm sorry. I apologise profusely. I'm deeply sorry. I apologise un unreservedly. I apologise. I apologise if I'm very sorry. I apologise. I apologise. Most important to We are apologising. I apologise. I apologise for that, and I do apologise for that. And we apologise deeply. I think if you set a new record for apologies, you can't make a selection. <laughs> 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 The judicious use of, use of the apology is something we recommend. Um, with the proviso that you've got to be very careful about what you're apologizing for. But it's, it's a key part of showing empathy, showing you get it. You know, your customers have been inconvenienced, your customers are angry. Um, obviously, in the case of when there's been customers injured or there's been loss of life. Um, you know, the form of words you choose uh, 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 is, is important. But you know, get the CEO out there, acknowledge what's happened, talk about how you're going to fix it, and apologize for the inconvenience of course. That's pretty much you know, crisis communication 101. Now, why did it not work in this particular case? Because they couldn't fix the problem. So there he is saying only a very small number of customers have been affected, and we, you know, we're going to fix this. A month later, customers are still not able to access, in some cases, access their account. In fact, if you try to use their smartphone app, this is what you get. So not surprisingly, this went on and on and on. And it had a major impact, not just on sentiment. You see spikes in, uh, spikes in sentiment. The second spike uh, on the, the left-hand chart there is when, the, when it was revealed or it became evident that in fact they not, that they, they put some fixes in that actually made the problem worse. Uh, so it all reared up again. And then there's a third spike where the CEO actually had to resign. You know, his credibility was shot to pieces. At one point, he actually said, "We're on our knees. We're on our knees. We don't know what to do with this." Uh, so once you, once you know, once the CEO of the organisation says that, you know, his credibility credibility is pretty much shot. So you'll see sentiment overwhelmingly negative. Now, what was the family reaction on TSB? TSB is actually owned by a Spanish group. It wiped a third of the value of the company in a month. So there's a slight recovery when they announced the CEO gone and he was, uh, he was being replaced, but they still couldn't fix the problem. So <clears throat> massive value reaction there. And why is that? Well, some research was done, um, it's now almost 20 years ago, uh, but it was a landmark bit of research at the time, and in fact, it's still valid. Um, it was done by a group of academics from um, uh, Oxford Metrica in the UK, <clears throat> and they looked at the impact of catastrophes on shareholder value. Um, and well, you, can read, you can read one of the conclusions yourself. You know, and it, it's a pretty predictable one. That if you have 
uh, a major crisis. And they looked at, by the way, at 15 different corporate crises from different industries just to see if there were any common traits that you could identify. Well, <clears throat> there was a value reaction they found. If companies were judged to have responded inadequately, a key word there is judged, because it is all about judgments. When something like happens like you botch a major IT upgrade or you drag one of your customers off your aircraft in full view of, uh, of, 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 the, uh, of social media, you're going to attract a lot of people's attention. People are going to, and, and when, when people start watching you, when the spotlight is on you, people will start learning things about you. They'll start learning, for example, the name of your CEO, which they probably wouldn't know before. Probably nobody knew who the CEO of Royce TSB was until he had to go out and start apologizing. Um, same with Oscar Mignos at United Airlines. So they will learn a lot about you. They'll learn who you are. They'll learn a lot of things about your company. And they will start, and what they learn will affect their perceptions of your company. Uh, so if you take the company's share price, it's not exactly, but if you take it as, a, as something of a barometer of market sentiment about that company, and more importantly, market, market confidence in the leadership of that organization, that would explain the value reaction. But one really interesting thing that they found was that companies which managed an effective response gain an average of about 5% in the same period of time. So there's a measurable difference between the value reaction, companies that are seen to have done badly or responded badly and inadequately in a crisis, and those which are seen to have responded well. The key thing there is it doesn't matter what the crisis is or whose fault it was. In other words, it doesn't actually matter what just happened, because the markets will accept that things go wrong. What they won't accept is a management team seems to be botching the response and can't fix the problem. And that's when the fund managers will move there, we will, will, will move out, and this will recommend sell, uh, because they see they don't see the company, the company recovering. So that explains the value, the value reaction. Now I'm going to show you an example, again, from a different industry now, that arguably the most crisis prone industry, which is the, uh, the food industry. Uh, <clears throat> this is the famous uh, story about when Kentucky Fried Chicken ran out of chicken. Uh, so, <laughs> It brings to mind the, the old saying about your ability to organize a party at a brewery, and I'm using the polite version. Um, anyway, so if you're, if you're a, a, a fried chicken franchise and you run out of chicken, um, it's a pretty serious matter for your customers. Now, I'm going to show you what happened to KFC and how they responded to it. <laughs> Food retail outfit. So, uh, Iceland Food says, uh, 
uh, I think one of the, one of the, uh, the facts that was revealed was that they, they couldn't provide any chicken, but they could provide, um, they could provide uh, gravy. So I had some foods called them and said, hmm, we should let the people decide what's more important for a fried chicken place. 69% said fried chicken, 31% gravy. So KFC then re replies, fair point. Can we borrow Peter Andre from you for our, for our grand reopening? Peter Andre is a Z-less Z -less celebrity in the UK, which I, I think had done an advertising campaign for, for, uh, for uh, Iceland Foods. Uh, so you know, yeah, shout out to all the staff at KFC for doing the best they can. Uh, KFC jumps back in and said, yeah, our staff, our staff are, are all, are all real, real, real heroes for all of this. Um, Burger King trolls and says, I knew you were out of chicken. I didn't realize you were out of fries too. KFC replies, putting all your chips on the table, bold with Burger King. When our chips arrive with natural steaks and two, put all our chips on the table. Until then, we have limited chips. <laughs> <laughs> a woman then put a video, it was a video of a, of a scramble in a Kentucky Fried Chicken outlet. Where a woman was, was almost in a fist fight to get the last piece of chicken. <laughs> and somebody, somebody filmed it and put it on the internet. Um, KFC is just it's a horror. We'd like to locate this lady. We we'll have one rice box left to head off. It's got her name on it. So they established, they established this very here. They, they didn't try to try and duck the story. They didn't um, absolve themselves of responsibility by throwing the HR under the bus. They didn't ignore what's being said on social media. They joined the conversation. And they joined in the conversation in a tone that was absolutely on brand. So it mixed acknowledgement with humor. Now, humor is not always the best response to a crisis, but in this particular case, I'm not know who died, people get chicken, get over it. Um, so you know, it, was a serious, it was a serious issue for them. But the real piece of resistance came when they finally apologized. They took out an advert in all the major newspapers in the UK to apologize, and it's gone down in in recent marketing history, Marcom's history, as the best apology ever. <laughs> so, so it's a chicken restaurant without any chicken. That's not ideal. <laughs> Huge apologies to our customers, especially those who traveled out of their way to find that we were closed. And endless thanks to our KFC team members uh, and those of our franchise partners who work, are working tirelessly uh, to improve the situation. It's been a hell of a week, but we're making progress. And every day, more and more fresh chicken is being delivered to our restaurants. Uh, thanks for bearing with us. There we are. So that, as I said, I, I can't tell you how many awards that, that, that's won. But somebody's got a lot of trophies on their shelf. Uh, I don't even know which agency did it, but I wish I'd do it there. Anyway, so the reaction was, was amazing. <laughs> Again, extremely positive. Everyone, you know, on, on social media, the, the 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 negative tone changed. I'll show you the analytics in just a moment. Uh, but people were just praising and saying, yeah, "Bravo, KFC! Best apology ever! Uh, KFC's outbound ad is brilliant, etc., etc. Nicely done, KFC. Even from other food companies. Uh, so this way, and even the police chipped in. Uh, for those who contacted the police about KFC being out for chicken, please stop. Their website says the press room store is now open." If you want to follow the four police cars through the drive. <laughs> so even the police, this is great to Manchester police, even they joined in uh, the tone of the conversation. And so if you look at the analytics, in the first stage of the crisis, overwhelmingly negative, it turned, it turned when, when the conversation became jokey and KFC was using humor to try and defuse uh, the negative sentiment, doing it very effectively. Uh, the market reaction, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult to it is difficult, you can't isolate KFC uh, from the performance of their parent company Yum, and they've got numerous other brands, but it had, it had some uh, negative impact when the crisis first hit, but again, they recovered very, very quickly in terms of the overall brand. So if you compare, if you put those three crises side by side, uh, we, we created a, a, a heat index, and it looked at a number of different metrics. It looked at the total volume of news mentions about that organization. It also looked at the, in the percentage of increase in Google search volumes for that particular brand during the crisis. It looked at the percentage increase in negative sentiment in, in online mentions during the crisis. And then it also looked at the peak. What was the peak uh, volume on social media when the crisis was at its worst? And you can see the relative impact there. 
The one that came out by far the worst was United Airlines. Even worse than TSB, though the TSB one went on much further and actually inconvenienced far more customers. Um, interesting that. I, I, I suggest that is actually because the, the visceral nature of the footage that was shared on social media of, um, of Dr. Dow, and also the fact that United just didn't seem to get it for so long. I mean, with the IT upgrade, people get the fact that it's difficult to fix. Uh, they get very angry about the fact they can't access a bank account, obviously. Um, but they're, they're somewhat forgiving. But when a, when a, a customer-facing organization like an airline gratuitously insults and abuses one of its customers, and then does not even acknowledge what's happened, that's when the real kind of anger kicks in, and it lasts. Now, the real irony of all of that, and it, 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 and it, it just illustrates beautifully another reputational risk that many consumer-facing companies uh, are facing, that was not the United Airlines flight. Anyone want to guess? This is worth another book. Anyone want to tell me whose aircraft that was? Whose aircraft that was? Delta? It wasn't Delta. It's now an called Republic. Uh, they were operating a franchise service on behalf of United Airlines. So it was a United brand, in fact, it was United Express. But the crew were not United crew, they were, they were Republic crew. Uh, it was not their aircraft. And the two goons, or the three goons in uniform, who dragged Dr. Dow off the aircraft, didn't work for either airline. They worked for Chicago Bear Airport. But it does illustrate the risk that you take when you outsource your service delivery to a partner, to a third party contractor, in this case a subcontractor. Because although it wasn't their aircraft and it wasn't their staff, it was absolutely their brand and their reputation that was hit. And Dr. Dow had bought his ticket from United Airlines thinking he would fly on the United Airlines. Um, so this is a phenomenon across the, the aviation industry, but it equally applies any, to any, any brand uh, that, 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 where their route to market is through, is through third-party third party contractors. Because you're only as good as the, the experience that you actually deliver to your customer. And the, diff the big difference now, uh, and everything I've been describing, is that customers now have a voice. And if you upset them, give them an opportunity they will share their disappointment with as wide an audience as they possibly can, and they won't go away. And of course, anyone else who's had the same type of experience will then jump in and amplify uh, the conversation and the negativity. So getting back to the airline industry, what has the industry actually done about this? <clears throat> the industry had a massive wake up in 2010. Uh, and actually, ironically, it happened right here in Singapore. Uh, some of you may remember Qantas A380 uh, was taking off from Changi Airport flying to Sydney um, and it was in November of 2010 and suffered a catastrophic engine failure four minutes into the flight, an engine fire, engine blew up and it literally was like a bomb going off on the, on the wing of the aircraft. There were over 500 penetrations of the wing fuselage by chunks of hot metal. Miraculously nobody was killed and that aircraft uh, in fact returned to land safely at Changi Airport. No aircraft ever been more severely damaged, no, no civilian airliner has it ever been more severely damaged in return to land safely. Mm -hmm. um, it's an incredible story, in fact, the whole book's been written about it. Um, but what actually happened there, the reason it was a wake-up call to the aviation industry, was when the explosion happened, the aircraft had to be over Batam Island, and debris from the aircraft showered down onto Batam Island. People started picking it up or photographing it and sharing those images on social media. And so very quickly, bits of fragmentary information that was appearing on social media, then pictures of aircraft debris led to this, just ignited this social media firestorm. Fire uh, so there was reports of an explosion in the sky over Batam, pictures of aircraft debris. I've got a, I've got a whole case study on this. There's a, a wonderful picture of two people holding up a piece of the engine cowling with the Qantas logo of the flying kangaroo, clearly visible. That was posted on Flickr. Journalists saw it called Qantas in Sydney, and there's a quote that runs underneath the picture saying, there is nothing to indicate this debris came from our aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> so that bit flying kangaroo, that's somebody else's, isn't it? <laughs> the point of that story is Qantas, which is you know, one of the most sophisticated advanced airlines in the industry, a real leader of the industry, did not have a social listening capability in November 2010, so they couldn't see the pictures. Now, the first that Qantas knew about this in, in Sydney 
I heard this uh, from their CEO, the first that the CEO knew about it, he got a call from investor relations saying the share price is, is falling and we don't know why. It, is there something, is something going on? <laughs> and what was going on was people were seeing reports on social media that the Qantas aircraft had crashed. Um, that actually then fed, so this will happen, well, so the key thing here was, it wasn't the first time there been social media uh, conversations about an aircraft accident. The first one was actually in December 2008, um, but it was the first time this had happened while the aircraft was still airborne. So while the story was still developing, and the airline, in this case Qantas, knew nothing about it. Now, one of the thing, things that happened when the engine exploded, it ripped out most of the communication systems on the airplane. The crew had one channel of communication, which they were using to talk to um, air traffic control. They could not talk to their operating center in Sydney. So down in Sydney, they were completely in the dark, had no idea what was going on. Uh, and except that the media were now calling the PR department to be told, we don't know anything, we've heard nothing. Uh, <coughs> now, the aircraft landed safely, but 20 minutes before it landed, uh, so stepping back a little bit, lots of journalists, you'll be surprised to hear, have Google Alerts and Yahoo Alerts, and lots of them now subscribe to data mining, which at that time didn't exist. So journalists started following this story, and journalists under deadline pressure, seeing this sensational story on social media, of course for rape were chasing the story. That led to mistakes being made. And the key one, which Reuters will never, will never live down, uh, Reuters published a breaking news alert saying Qantas confirms crashed aircraft is A380. Now, if you don't know Reuters, it's the oldest and probably the most respected newswire service in the world. It goes, the Reuters feed goes into virtually every newsroom in the world. It's that trusted. Uh, so if Reuters says your A380 has crashed, it's then very difficult to put that toothpaste back in the tube. Because as far as the world is concerned, your aircraft has just crashed. Uh, 20 minutes later, it landed in Chengdu. Uh, but Qantas still had to try and put the toothpaste back in the tube. Now, the CEO, and Alan Joyce, actually held a press conference at 4 o'clock. Uh, and announced that the safe of the aircraft had only been hurt, the aircraft was very damaged, what they were doing to reaccommodate passengers, etc. He, he did an interview with the Wall Street Journal about two weeks later, and they said, we were set up in our response for how the world used to be. We were, we, you know, we were very confident we had it down, but we were, we were talking about a different world. We, we completely missed this whole social, social media thing. So within two weeks, they had a social media capability at Qantas. Um, but, uh, more significantly, Joyce was a member of the IRH Board of Governors. So at the next Board of Governors meeting, you know, he, he brought this up and he said, look, something just happened. And if we weren't ready for it, pretty, pretty much certain nobody else in this industry is either. So something must be done. So that something was IATA launched an initiative to first of all codify best practice in crisis communications, bring that into the modern era in the digital age. <clears throat> My involvement with this was twofold. I was, there was a kickoff meeting in Geneva where we had all the A380 operators, including SIA, all the aircraft manufacturers, all the engine manufacturers, the major US and European safety agencies as well, to look at this and say, what just happened here? Um, and that's something that something must be done. So I asked to say to me, they said, look, we'll take, we're prepared to take the lead on this, but we don't have the resources, so can you do this? So they gave me the job of writing this. Um, so the first one was published uh, early in 2012. Um, we launched it with a global conference, it was in Bangkok. And it was the first document that actually codified roles and responsibilities in communication to every party involved in the response for a major event. Now you might think, well, I'm not an airline, why does that matter? I'll, I'll show you why in, in a moment, why it matters and why some of the guidelines in there are pretty much universal and would apply to anybody. Uh, but it did, it laid out what are the role of the airline, the engine manufacturer, the aircraft manufacturer, the airport, ATC, the government agencies, all the other parties involved, and how do we use this new family thing called social media uh, and online channels and integrate them all into a, into a consistent response. Uh, <clears throat> the document was updated in 2014 because the world had changed even more in the intervening two years. We did it again in 2016. I was just reminded yesterday, I opened the draft of the 2018 edition by, edition by the end of the month. So it's now an established pattern. We upgrade it, we update it every two years because so much has changed. 
um, and there are other things, uh, other risks appearing, like cyber security, a massive thing. Uh, British Airways is back in the news again this morning. Uh, Cafe Pacific is back in the news again yesterday. Data breaches are happening everywhere, and it's really serious. It's only going to get worse. Um, so that's another risk we're going to be identifying and talking about in the, in the best practice guidelines. So some of the recommendations in there. First of all, if you don't have social listening, you don't necessarily have to have data like that, but if you don't at least employ an agency to tell you there's a conversation going on here about you, how would you know? And if you don't know, you can't respond. So, uh, so use social listening as an early warning capability. Have a plan. Develop that plan. It doesn't have to be a 200-page document, but have a plan and develop that plan in the next time. You can't develop a plan in the middle of a crisis. Um, be ready to activate and respond within minutes. Um, we set a benchmark in the IELTS guidelines that airlines should be ready or should think about how they would do this. Would you be ready to respond within 15 minutes of becoming aware of an incident? Not 15 minutes after the incident happened, but 15 minutes after the conversation started on social media. Because breaking news now pretty much breaks on Twitter. Um, so if you are, as you are with airlines, and you're aware that a picture has been posted on Twitter of an aircraft and a crash, are you ready? 15 minutes. And what can you say in 15 minutes? All you can really do is acknowledge, yes, we are aware of it and we're mobilizing our response. And if you have factual information, it is our aircraft, that would make it flight, flight number XYZ. And we know it's in San Francisco. In that case, it was a 214. So confirm the factual information you have. But once you've opened a communication channel and established yourself as a voice and a source, you then update it. And you update it as quickly as new information uh, comes in. Make sure you integrate all own channel channels into the communication response. One of the things um, you would have seen if you, if you visited uh, ASEAN on the day of that accident, their website, their websites, multiple websites in Europe, the first thing you saw when you went to the homepage was smiling faces. You just killed three people and ridden off an aircraft. It's so not the time to show people smiling faces on your website. Now that's not because they were being insensitive or didn't care, so they would be thought about it. So one of the things that, that companies get, uh, I've got a great case study on Samsung, when the Note uh, <coughs> 7, exactly the same thing happened. Mixed messages across every different touch point. So and the, the reason for that is different ownership of different channels. Organizations working in silos. Uh, you know, who owns the website typically in a, in a consumer facing company? Marketing, commercial, because it, it's just a distribution, a sales channel. Um, it's not corporate communications. So you need to look at all the different touch points and integrate all of them into your response. So making sure your message and your brand is consistent across every touch point, not just online, but offline too. Um, so people are hearing and seeing the same things, the same message. Uh, make sure you're monitoring the ongoing conversations as KFC was doing, uh, and be prepared to engage. It's not always appropriate to do that. With Malaysia Airlines after 370, there were tens of thousands of conversations going on every day, especially up in China. Um, Malaysia Airlines physically could not, even if they wanted to, engage in all those conversations. But what we were doing in the crisis center, we were getting a, a heat map every day that was analyzing the sentiment <coughs> and doing uh, analysis by market, um, the key markets in Malaysia, in China, I think in Europe as well. Um, and we were looking at how sentiment changed in response to different developments. It was just a good kind of litmus test of what was going on and whether uh, what was working and what wasn't, and clearly a lot was not. Uh, uh, make sure you've got an employed social media policy. Um, I wrote the social media policy for AirAsia. It's basically 10 bullet points. Keep it really simple. And the premise, the starting premise at AirAsia is probably 90% of their employees are on social media every day anyway. They're probably most of them very proud of the fact they work for AirAsia. So what are they going to do? They're going to post pictures of themselves in their uniform. They're going to post pictures of their colleagues. They're going to post pictures of themselves on AirAsia aircraft. If there's an accident, which there was in December 2014, what we don't want them to do is start posing happy snaps or making comment about what just happened when there's been lost life. So the point we're trying to make with the employed social media policy is you are an ambassador. Ambassador for AirAsia, you identify yourself as such. We're happy for you to do that. Feel free to 
talk about how much you love working for AirAsia, but if, some, if certain things happen, exercise some common sense. Don't post some sensitive comments. Um, so it, most of it is common sense, it's just, it's just advice. But it was prescriptive in a couple of things. Never post anything which is, uh, which is insensitive or uh, offensive on racial or religious grounds. It's obvious, isn't it? You'd be amazed how many people do that. Uh, <clears throat> And don't post anything which is confidential or company information. And don't attack any of your colleagues or complain about any of your colleagues on social media or about any of our competitors. And that's it. So keep it really, really simple. So do have an employee social media policy. Probably most of your employees, especially their 20 or 30 somethings, will be on social media anyway. And then lastly, exercise the plan and make sure you're reviewing it regularly. It's actually not the plan that matters, it's the planning process. Because when something like MH370 happens, you're off the plan. There is no plan for that. Uh, nothing like that's ever happened before. Uh, so very often, crises veer off in unexpected directions. Um, but the plan is, is, where the plan is most effective is in the first couple of hours. When everyone's running around with their hair on fire, not knowing what to do. And it, a plan will help you to structure your thinking. It will, it will organize people into roles and responsibilities. But the rest of it is down to professional judgment. And a plan is not a substitute for judgment. But the more you've got into the planning process, the more you've tested the plan, the more ingrained those procedures become. And then you're reacting, your instinct, you're, you're aligning your instincts, and you're trained, you, know, you retain knowledge with your professional judgments. Okay, now so what does this actually mean for you? Uh, <clears throat> those are lessons specific for the aviation industry. As I said, they do apply to pretty much any organization. So boiling it down and bringing it home for all of you. Start with doing your homework. Identify what are the risks that your organization has. It, it, it is going to depend on, you know, the, fun, the, the other fundamental principles of response are the same. The risk factors that you encounter that you run are going to be different, depending on the nature of your organization, whether you're a B2B organization or you're a B2C organization. So identify your risks. Where are you most vulnerable? What are the things that are most likely to happen? And what would you actually do who would you actually need to engage with? You know, if you had a brand recall, for example, or you know, a product defect, or you know, a sexual harassment lawsuit, or whatever it may be, think through the most likely scenarios you might face, and then think about, well, who would we actually need to talk to? Who are the really important audiences? But there are lots, there are, all, there are always lots, but prioritize who are the most important group to talk to, and it always starts with the people most affected, directly affected. Um, so, who, we, who, who are the audiences, and then how would we reach them? How do we get to where they are? The answer may be social media, it may not be. Depends on the situation. So think it all through. Be prepared to respond quickly. Now, in the airline industry, I said we set the benchmark for 15 minutes. There's nothing magic about the 15 minute thing. It's as quickly as you can, but if you don't set a target, you'll still be stroking the chin and thinking about it three hours later. Um, or submitting your, your tweet for legal review and getting it back the next day. Um, actually, there's an interesting bit of research, which is out of date now, but I, I still use it. Um, it's from 2013, uh, and it's surveyed communication professionals from across um, many different geographies that collectively been involved in 2,000 reputation crises. And the survey was about the impact of social media on how crises develop. The research is a very interesting bit of research. It doesn't tell you anything you couldn't have guessed. You know, social media makes it worse, makes the crisis spread more quickly, makes it spread to more markets. Um, so all those numbers are not really very surprising. But the one thing that stands out is on average, now bearing in mind this is 2013, on average, it takes companies 21 hours to issue meaningful communication in the crisis. 21 hours. I'd argue we barely have 21 minutes to make 20. Now, if we were to do that research again today, the numbers would be different, but I'd be willing to bet not that different. Not that different. I know one major MNC that I work with here in Singapore. Uh, their name is on the skyline around Singapore. They have no social media presence at all. I've run out, I've wasted so much breath trying to tell them they should have it, but anyway. Uh, so be prepared to respond quickly uh, and, and think about how you would do that. What kind of approvals you would need? Uh, uh, own the story. I mean, KFC is a beautiful example of owning the story, uh, being all over it, acknowledging it, being part of it, talking about how you're going to fix the 
problem, and then engaging in the conversations that are happening around it. <coughs> always put people first. If you're in doubt on where to start with your messaging, it's always about the people affected. Now, those people may just be upset, they may be a bit annoyed, they may be disappointed, they may be a bit inconvenienced, they may have lost loved ones in an accident. Um, so you calibrate your response to what actually has happened and the degree of emotion that's involved, but acknowledge that emotion, because it's, by, it's, it's when you don't acknowledge emotion, as United Airlines didn't, that's when the crisis gets worse, uh, and it doesn't go away. Um, remember that actions speak louder than words. It's not about it's not about glib statements. It's not about putting your CEO out there to apologise. It's about what are you doing? And an apology will only ring true and will only win win you friends and support if it's backed up with concrete action. So it's not empty rhetoric. So align actions with words. In other words, do what you say. Follow from the promises that you made and say what you're doing. Sounds simple. It is, it's never been more complicated than it is today. Okay, thanks very much for your attention. I hope you found that, that, uh, that useful. Um, we have some time for questions. Quite a bit time. First, in terms of the response time, right? Now, how do you balance that speed with, say, accuracy, given all these points around fake news and stuff like that? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So, it's how do you balance speed against accuracy? Um, you, put your, you put your finger right on a, a really key issue because, all right, there may be a conversation now raging on social media about something you're alleged to have done. Did you actually do it? Because the minute you go out there and acknowledge that you did, that the, 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 the complaints are justified, you've now validated them. And once you say something as a company, it's very difficult to roll back. Um, so so yeah, as a general bit of advice, um, you know, I, I work with, um, primarily with airlines, it's make sure, it, trade a bit of speed for accuracy, if necessary. Make sure you know, but that's why American Airlines has moved its social media team into the off center, because they know um, now, I'll give you a quick, as we've got a bit of time, I'll digress very quickly. About 10 days after Dr. Dow, United, uh, American Airlines had a somewhat similar incident, you probably remember, in Strollergate, where a woman was trying to carry a double baby stroller onto the aircraft and was told she couldn't, and then virtually a fist fight ensued. And again, it all got shared on social media. Um, <clears throat> now, American Airlines had been running an experiment, it was meant to last for two weeks. What would happen if they put their social media team, would it help if they had their social media team on the bridge? Um, and uh, they actually suffered, they come about the third day of that, they suffered an engine failure in Chicago. Um, and they saw pictures on social media on data miner before the ops center even knew that something had happened. And they called the captain and they said, the captain said it's all under control. Really? Have you seen the picture on something? From that moment on, once the ops people could actually see how this looked, to the outside world, their whole attitude changed. So <clears throat> social media was then embedded, that became a permanent thing. So when the Dr. Dow thing happened, they watched all that play out. Their CEO, about two days afterwards, when the dust had settled, called all the comms people in and said, I want to know what would we have done. Let's war game this because we're next up. You know, this is going to happen sooner or later, we're going to have the same thing or something very similar. So I don't want to repeat what you might have just um, so they, uh, they, 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 they planned it out, what would happen if they had an aggressive, you know, a, a major a kind of a, a, a violent incident on their aircraft where they, one well, of their crew was to blame, appeared to be to blame. Um, and 10 days later it happened. So they did not make the same mistake. First of all, they saw the pictures as they appeared on social media. They got the ops duty manager to call the captain of the aircraft. He confirmed what was going on. They actually delayed the pushback from the gate uh, to try and resolve the whole thing. They took the crew member, remember this kind of shaking headed crew member, was threatened to fight on the passengers. They took him off the aircraft, replaced him, suspended him, uh, <coughs> uh, pending an investigation, and they, they issued a first response immediately. Uh, and they said, you know, we need, to, we need to find out exactly what happened here, but what we've seen, the, the, what we've seen, what see, is not acceptable to us. Um, and they diffused it, the story dropped out of the power of the news in about two days. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, they, 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 there's, a, there's a whole backstory about what happened afterwards to the woman who crashed and they, they took special care of her. Um, 
she didn't actually realise that it had caused such a huge media fuss uh, until she got, she was going to Brazil, I think, until she got to Brazil, it was like, really? Wow. Uh, so she knew, knew nothing about all that. But anyway, um, so you've got to be prepared quickly, but you've got to be able to validate what you're actually talking about. Because it may be a hoax. So we live in the era of fake news, right? Okay. Anyone, any other questions? Yes. Um, in the event of a crisis, it's not going to be just yourself and one person making these decisions. So how, who do you want in your team uh, and how important is it or who in your experience leads that or is it, or is it decisions by committee? It's typically decisions by committee but it's not a democracy. So um, you know, in, in the aviation industry they tend to follow the military command and control model. It's the NATO actually that you can take the NATO command and control model and apply it. To a crisis response team, actually not just in the aviation industry, but in many industries, it's, it's about command and control. So you've got a strategic team that leads, that represent, that's got executive authority. The CEO typically would not be a member of that committee. He's delegated authority to an emergency director. Uh, and you want to represent the key functions that will be involved in responding. So it may be operations, legal, HR, um, <coughs> treasury. Uh, so the, the head, people who, who, are, who are empowered to make decisions. Then you've got a, there's a gold, silver, bronze model as well. So you've got gold is strategic. Um, silver would be if, there's a re, if your global company is a regional operation. And then bronze is the tactical activation at the, at the front line. And it cascades down. So there's, there's escalation protocols, but the model replicates at every step down. The absolutely key thing is if the communication response is going to work, comms has to be part of the gold group. So if you, if you as a head of communications in the organization don't know what the technical team is deciding, how can you communicate that? Um, and also, how can you explain to them how this is playing and, and, and you know, the emotions and sensitivities involved? So <clears throat> it's a two-way role, really. It's to inform, it's, it's to inform the, the, the crisis management team, the strategic team, how this looks and what the issues are in terms of public perception, but then also be part of the decision-making so that when we're communicating, it's all aligned and it's all joined in the head. So that, that's the classic model. Doesn't always work that way. Yeah. Um, I remember going to the, 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 the crisis center of British Airways at Heathrow a number of years ago now. I wrote their, their original crisis plan uh, for BA. <clears throat> and they were saying in the strategic operations center, the, the crisis management center, they call it OCIC. Um, again, they've got the strategic group, it's quite small, about six, six senior executives. Um, and the, the makeup of that group will, depend, will change depending on what they're dealing with. Is it an aircraft accident? Is it, is it a major severe weather incident? Is it a Terminal 1 fire at Heathrow, which they have? Is it something else? Uh, <clears throat> so it depends who you're going to bring to the, to the, in, into the group and what specific expertise you need. But the one constant is always the head of comms. Uh, and if the head of comms are not available, they're ultimate, they're ultimate, they're ultimate. We'll keep going down until we find them. Because we have to have comms at the table. And, and frictions, is there, is there a particular bit that you find you come across? <laughs> I have my where, theory on this. Where, where, where do we start? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, well, typically, from a comms perspective, um, there are typically two points of tension. One is with a commercial organization, um, and I'll come back to that. The other is with legal. Yeah. Um, and you know, one, 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 thing, one thing you have to, you, know, you have to get over is Although you're coming at the problem from different perspectives, you've got different priorities, you're all trying to get to the same place. So you know, the enlightened organizations recognize the potential friction there and talk it out beforehand. So they have they reach an understanding between either their internal legal counsel or their external counsel and the comms people about what are the issues we might face in this situation. You know, what are you really concerned about? You know, if, if the comms people know what the legal guys are concerned about, you can find a way of words looking state so you don't go there. And similarly, if, if you've talked about it beforehand and built up a relationship, the legal people then know what comes priorities are um, and, and they're willing to be more flexible. What you don't want is having two entrenched camps, you know, and the CEO or the emergency director having to play on by. Now going back to commercial, this is a perennial problem, not just in the aviation industry. Um, and it's, uh, it's, a, without, it's across the, the spectrum. The reason being, you know, who actually owns the brand and the voice of the brand or the organization? Is it comms or is it marketing? Uh, it depends who you ask. But what does tend to happen in any big organization is power follows the money. Who has more money typically? Commercial, 
marketing board comms. Um, and so where that tends to play out is in, in who owns social media, for example. Um, so if you remember going back to MH370, one of the platforms they made, I think it was two or three weeks after they did their bond, was um, somebody had the bright idea of launching a promotion, I think it was in New Zealand, um, called the Bucket List Challenge. Things you like to do before you die. Great, if you've got an aircraft missing, a lot of people in fact did die. Uh, and you think it's a good idea to launch a social media promotion. And that made it from New Zealand. I mean, that story went global. Why did that happen? Was anyone trying to be offensive? Was trying to be, no. It wasn't because of mischief. It's because marketing and comms were in two different silos, and they weren't talking to each other. Um, <clears throat> so I actually wrote a board paper for Malaysia Airlines to try and resolve that, that issue. And, uh, and what they want to know is how do other organizations do it? Now, Singapore Airlines has uh, a social media team, 24 7. It sits partly within marketing, but partly within public affairs. Um, but nothing goes out on social media on any channel that has not been reviewed by public affairs. There's a simple reason for that, two actually. One is that the only department in the whole company that specifically tasked with monitoring the external environment and looking for reputational risk. Um, which no other department is. Secondly, who's going to have to clear up the mess if there's another bucket of solution? Uh, <clears throat> so it's a simple, you know, it, it, they didn't get there, it wasn't an easy process to get that agreement in place, but that's what happens. So not every organization is like that. So that's a long winded answer. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, with your experience in the Singapore context and in recent years, perhaps you can cite. Uh, one organization that has crisis managed well and perhaps another that didn't work? Um, I mean, while we're on the subject of aviation, uh, Singapore Airlines actually had a really interesting example. And it was in, in, so for backing up a little bit, when the current head of, of, of public affairs joined the airline, I think only one person in the entire company was allowed to access the internet from his, from his desk. That was the CEO, not the head of corporate for public affairs. But they've undergone a pretty seismic mind, 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 mind shift since then. Uh, <clears throat> so Singapore Airlines, for a long time, did not embrace social media. They were actually quite frightened of it because people could talk back to you. It's no longer a you know, online, people could talk back. There was the Singapore Airlines Facebook page, but it was a fan page. It wasn't quite like that. But after a lot of, of thought, they decided they had to embrace this. But typically, Singapore Airlines, they did it extremely thoroughly. Um, and the day that they went live on their social channels, one of their, their metrics was they had to be re ready for a reputation crisis that day. So they took the view that they could go out and launch on social media and then have a major IT interruption or something and not have it well. Um, so they, 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 they thought it through very thoroughly. Where it was tested, they had, I don't know if you remember this, they had an A380 flying from London back to Singapore that had a slow, that had a leaking door seal, a slow depressurization that had to divert into Baku, in Uzbekistan. I'm pretty sure that nobody on that aircraft thought they were going to end up in Uzbekistan. They thought they were going to be from Singapore. So <clears throat> the aircraft couldn't go anywhere, so all the people had to be offloaded. Singapore Airlines doesn't operate there, so they had no, no staff on the ground. They didn't even have a handling agent. They very quickly scrambled and got one. Uh, tried to get some local help at the airport, but it happened to be nighttime. Um, <clears throat> the obvious thing to do would be to take all those passengers and put them in a hotel, um, <clears throat> if you could find hotel rooms, because it was going to take at least 18 to 20 hours to get a relief aircraft to Uzbekistan. Um, well, they couldn't do that because none of those, none of those passengers had visas to enter Uzbekistan, so they were all confined in the airport. The, retail, the uh, food and beverage outlets were all closed, there was limited accommodation seating, so people had to lie on the floor with no blankets, um, no food, but they did very helpfully have free Wi-Fi. So you can picture what happened next. <laughs> so, so Singapore Airlines Facebook page and Twitter and every other social media channel was lit up with about 400 very unhappy passengers venting their, their unhappiness on social media. And you know, people had real issues. You know, my medication's on the plane, I can't, I can't go back to the aircraft. My baby, I don't have any diapers. My baby, we don't have any fresh water. We haven't got any food. You know, my elderly father's sleeping on the, you know, lying on the floor with their blankets. What do you do? Um, well, Singapore Airlines, their um, KPI for their social media team 
is they have to respond to any post within 15 minutes. Now, typically, if it's a, a disappointing customer with an issue, my bag was lost, I, you know, I was offloaded from my flight, they'll say, they'll take it offline. They'll say, please call us on this number, and they'll take it out of the public, uh, public view. They did the opposite with this one. They engage with those passengers in a conversation in real time on social media. They first of all, explain what had happened, so this was a safety issue. Uh, this was the only, the safest options to land in Baku. And we're sorry about what happened. Uh, we're sorry about the inconvenience. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, <clears throat> we're mobilizing another A380 to fly up and pick you up. It's going to take some time. In the meantime, our crew will bring all the blankets and pillows off the aircraft. That may even be there now. They're coming, they're coming anyway. They're going to bring all the food and beverage off the aircraft. Uh, don't worry, we'll give you, know, if there's anything you need, like medication, tell us what seat you're in. We'll go and get the bag for you. So, in other words, responding to the actual problems those people were, people were encountering. Now, that all happened in the public view. And it's interesting, if you track the conversations, people from around the world who were Singapore Airlines fans then joined the conversation saying, hey, you guys are the best. I fly with you all the time. This is a hell of an airline. This is the way to do it. And the tone of the conversation totally changed. Now, when those passengers finally got back, and they were, it took 21 hours to go and pick them up, and they couldn't get over flight rights, Across India for a special flight. Anyway, they finally got them, picked them up, all the back. Of course, the media were waiting. By then, it was all over the news media too. Um, the passengers came off and said, "Look, you know, yes, we weren't happy about it, but you know, the crew were great. They did their best. And these things happened. Um, Singapore Airlines treated us really well. They, they rebooked our flights. Yeah, I'd fly them again tomorrow. No problem." So the, even the media coverage was all uh, you know, pretty laudatory. Um, now, the interesting thing about that whole incident was Singapore Airlines did not issue a single press release. They managed the entire thing, including the media, on Facebook. Because the media could watch conversations happening. And so Singapore Airlines didn't have to say anymore. Um, so it was a, it's a very good um, example. Now, the less good examples are where we start SMRT. <laughs> 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 I, mean, look, I, 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 I hesitate to criticize companies. Um, they may not sound like it. Because um, I always take you, if you worked in the room, how would you know? You don't know what they, what they were really dealing with if you weren't there. Um, so yes, we see the outside, we see the reaction, um, and the point of you know, things that have obviously gone wrong, but I always get around to criticize. Nobody tries to handle a crisis badly. Um, you know, it just happens. Um, but it happens because you haven't prepared for it, it typically. Or you don't get it. You don't understand the depth of emotion and anger that you're going to be caused. And if you don't acknowledge that, that's <coughs> where it goes back. Okay, very good. Thank you so much.